Hello, folks. Welcome to another great lot of the Southwest. You're watching GLC. And today we have an incredible new friend, uh, ambassador and diplomat uh, specializing in, in U.S. and Israeli relations and U.S. policy in the Middle East. Um, he also has the Edinger Report online, uh, the EdingerReport.com. You're going to hear more about that, but it's none other. Welcome to GLC, Yoram Edinger. How are you today, sir? Very well, thank you. And it's my pleasure to be in touch with folks in uh, in Texas. Uh, I've had a long history with Texas. I did my undergraduate uh, in El Paso, Texas, back in the late 1960s. I have uh, relatives in uh, Texas. I served as Israel's Consul General uh, to the Southwest, based in Houston, Texas. And I had the privilege of spending uh, much time in uh, small town uh, America, among them also uh, Odessa, Midland. Uh, I spent time in uh, Amarillo, which is slightly larger. Uh, but generally speaking, I've learned to appreciate the Lone Star State, especially coming from the state of the Lone Star of David. And uh, we have much in common between, I think, our two, uh, 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 two entities and mostly a defiance of us. And I think both Texas and Israel have done very well primarily because of uh, faith and defiance in of uh, of us well sir i can't express my appreciation for you enough i'm excited to meet you i know this is the first of many of times as as far as, as we are concerned but texas loves israel and i tell you what there's a lot of similarities with that can-do spirit that fearless spirit that uh, Texas seems to have that no other state seems to have here in the United States. And of course, you know, there's a lot of people who love Israel uh, in the state of Texas. You know, when I travel international, um, people uh, would always comment that when you're from anywhere else in the United States and you're asked where you're from, they say, I'm from the United States. But you can always tell a Texan because when they're overseas or any other part of the world, they don't say I'm from, I'm from America. They say, I'm from Texas, <laughs> so we're, we're very proud to, uh, uh, to associate yeah, with I, th you, I think both of us, uh, Israelis and Texans, adhere to the three Gs, uh, God, guns, and uh, guts. Uh, if you, if, you, <laughs> you, if you lack any of that, you cannot make it in the Middle East. And uh, we have learned to uh, unite adherence to those three very, very critical uh, values, which has sustained us uh, uh, in face of uh, much, much adversity in the Middle East. Wow. Now, for over 50 years, uh, you've specialized in uh, the, the U.S.-Israeli relations and U.S. policy in the Middle East. And when did you create the Edinger Report.com? What an incredible news source. When, when did you start that, Joram? Well, I, I retired from uh, civil service uh, at the end of 92, and that's when I decided to persist in doing what I did as a, uh, of, an Israeli official, namely trying to enhance U.S.-Israel relations, attempting to shed light on the very complex, frustrating reality of the Middle East, and in the process also expose uh, wishful thinking, oversimplifications, right. and misrepresentations, which sadly, sadly, has characterized the so-called so-called elite media and its coverage of the of the Middle East. Wow. Well, you know, I would ask you, uh, what what did you think after all of your years of of being a bridge between the United States and Israel and the United States and the Middle East. What what came across your mind when you saw that Trump uh, moved the embassy, the U.S. embassy, to Jerusalem? Well, uh, finally uh, came a president who sent a message to rogue elements in the Middle East. Uh, you cannot threaten me. You cannot pressure me. 
You cannot expect me to ignore reality because of your terrorism. And reality is that Jerusalem has been the exclusive capital of the Jewish uh, people for the last 3,500 uh, years. Sadly, sadly, previous uh, presidents ignored the law of the land because in 1995, uh, Congress passed a law, and this is the Jerusalem Embassy Law, which recognizes Jerusalem as the exclusive capital of the Jewish state. Series of presidents were deterred by Arab pressure, and therefore they kept postponing it, namely uh, uh, not implementing the law of the land. Then came President uh, Trump, and he decided to uh, resurrect, in many respects, the U.S. posture of deterrence in defiance of rogue pressure coming from the Middle East. In fact, the so-called uh, wise man of the State Department warned uh, President Trump, and they told him that such a decision would cause, would trigger a volcano of anti-American uh, terrorism. And as we know, uh, absolutely nothing of that sort happened. In fact, it only enhanced the stature of the U.S. in the eyes of uh, its Arab allies in the Middle East. Wow. You know, you mentioned before the recording, my friend, that, you know, an administration can either help the problem and help deter the problem or feed the problem in, in so many words. Uh, what would you, what administration are you, do you feel free to say which administration you feel has been the most? Well, uh, the, the law, the law was passed in 1995. So you had the, then President Clinton. Right. And then President Clinton was succeeded by President George W. Bush. Right. And then uh, came President Obama. And none of them, none of them implemented the law of the land. None of them had the guts to recognize uh, reality. And each one of them succumbed to either error pressure or unrealistic advice by the State Department. It was quite a statement to move our embassy there because it, it, it is it an, an oversimplification to say that by making such a decision that anyone who, who would attack Jerusalem would be attacking America, thus her embassy being in Jerusalem? Well, I, I think it, it, uh, it sent the signal uh, to the world at large, but primarily to the Middle East, that uh, the U.S. has decided to base its policy on reality rather than on misrepresentations. Uh, prior administrations contemplated uh, making Jerusalem once again a divided city and uh, force Israel to withdraw from parts of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, President Trump, in fact, uh, so far uh, uh, was the only president, the only president since 1948, when Israel was established, the only president to avoid pressuring Israel. Every president from 1948 until January 2017 pressured Israel. Some did it brutally, some did it uh, mildly. President Trump was the, so far, the only American president who not only did not pressure Israel, but in fact enhanced the stature of Israel, and not only in Jerusalem. He also recognized Israel's sovereignty on the Golan uh, Heights. And uh, the significance of uh, that recognition uh, is not only uh, related to Israel's national security, because those heights uh, in the hands of Syria before 1967 posed quite a threat to Israel's national security. But in addition, once again, President Trump and his team recognized that Israel on the Golan Heights enhances, advances U.S. national security. Israel on the Golan Heights today 
constrains dramatically the maneuverability of the Russians in Syria. It constrains the maneuverability of the Ayatollahs of Iran in Syria, and it constrains large number of uh, Islamic terrorist groups operating in Syria. The Golan Heights is a, a, a spot between uh, Israel, Syria, and Jordan. Back in 1970, pro-Soviet Syria invaded pro-U.S. Jordan. 1970, U.S. was backed down in uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, could not avail any military force to help uh, uh, then King Hussein of uh, Jordan, and a loss of uh, Jordan, or tackling the pro-U.S. Pro regime in Jordan, replacing it by a radical pro-Soviet regime, could have had traumatic impact on the Arabian Peninsula, the supply of oil, global economy, U.S. national security. At that time, President Nixon called the Israeli prime minister, shared with her the concern. Within 24 hours, Israel deployed more Israeli troops to the Golan Heights, and within 48 hours, the Syrian invasion of Jordan retreated back to Syria without firing a single shot. It was Israel's posture of deterrence which convinced Syria to withdraw and saved basically the life of the pro-U.S. Hashemite regime in Jordan and accorded the U.S a major, major national security prize and deprive the Soviets of what they were expecting, a bonanza at the expense of the U.S. And here came uh, President Trump, and he was the first American president who in 2018 recognized Israel's sovereignty on the Golan Heights. Once again, it's good for Israel, but it's also good for uh, for America. You know, I, I, I admire you, sir, and your website is incredible. Um, my goodness. Uh, people can subscribe to your website, for your newsletter, uh, the Edinger Report, folks. You see it at the bottom of your screen, but you're covering so much. And of course, Islamic terrorism, uh, J uh, Jerusalem, Judea and Sam uh, Samaria, settlements, Golan, economy. Uh, uh, my goodness, very educational, very insightful. I really don't believe that I have seen uh, uh, a news source uh, that has all of the things that you have. Uh, my my uh, uh, encouragement to you, sir, uh, this is an amazing report. You know, for those who read below the Edinger report, they see second thought a U.S. Israel initiative, and you've talked about, alluded to wistful thinking in light of the activist media that, that many would say seems to be anti-Israel and anti-America. Uh, could you expound on the second thought, the U.S. Israel initiative? Well, as, as the name suggests, my aim has been to introduce a second thought namely non-conventional, politically incorrect, but mostly uh, an approach which sticks by reality and uh, does, not, does not sacrifice reality on the altar of wishful uh, thinking. Uh, you take uh, the current policy towards Iran, for instance. Uh, it all started back in uh, 1978, 1979, uh, when the Islamic Revolution exploded in Iran. At that time, the U.S. administration, President Jimmy Carter, uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, uh, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, they genuinely assumed that the Ayatollahs of Iran merely seek democracy, merely seek stability and liberty, and they were supposed to be 
pro-Americans. They were supposed to so-called understand that American support is needed for them. And it, this wishful thinking went to the extent that uh, there was a meeting of global leaders 10 days before the February 1st return of Ayatollah Khomeini to Iran, which started the Islamic Revolution. 10 days before that, President Carter told um, a meeting of global leaders in the islands of Guadeloupe that he expected the Ayatollahs of Iran to be preoccupied with tractors, not with tanks. And he expected them to be moderate. And he expected the Ayatollah Khomeini, the so-called Supreme Commander, to allow his lieutenants who were educated in the West, who spoke English and German, he expected them to carry the day and basically continue siding with the USA. Here we are in 2000. Uh, 22, not much has changed as far as the establishment of foreign policy in Washington. They still accord the smooth diplomatic talk coming out of Tehran much more weight than the rogue walk which has characterized the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. And by the way, this is not primarily an Israeli problem. Uh, Americans should know that as far as the vision guiding the Ayatollahs of Iran, it's, it transcends the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. It transcends Africa and Asia. It extends all the way to Latin America currently. Uh, the Iranians, together with their proxy, the Hezbollah terrorists from Lebanon and Syria, are very well entrenched in South and Central America. They have been there since the early 1980s in conjunction with the major drug cartels of Mexico and Colombia and Bolivia. They operate primarily in the trilateral areas in the trilateral border areas of Argentina and Paraguay and Brazil, as well as Chile and Peru and Bolivia. And there they maintain training camps for terrorists, introducing the Iranian and Hezbollah uh, tactics of car bombs, suicide bombing, and improvised explosive devices. Recently, they have exported to the area technologies which enable the construction of tunnels similar to the tunnels connecting between the Sinai Peninsula and Gaza, whereby they smuggle military systems, tunnels between Gaza and Israel, which attempt to smuggle terrorists. And currently, they are trying to do the same thing on the U.S.-Mexico border. Oh, yeah. uh, they have, they have uh, um, uh, been engaged in drug trafficking. They have been engaged in human trafficking, in money uh, laundering, all again in South and Central America, as well as operating many slipper cells in the U.S. own mainland. We're talking about a rogue regime in Iran, which is driven by a 1,400-year-old Islamic Shiite uh, vision, which aims at transforming the entire globe into a, u a unified Islamic uh, entity Caliphate. guided by the Quran and submitting, subordinating the so-called infidel Christians and infidel uh, Jews. You know, many would assume that the refusal to secure the borders, even the help of the federal government, flying these illegals to any place in the, in the United States they wish to go and releasing them into our streets. Some would assume well, that, that uh, this is a, uh, uh, a partnership with this current administration uh, helping to coordinate its own invasion. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, there, there's no doubt that the state of the border today, whether it's in uh, Rio Grande Valley, whether it's uh, in Texas or Arizona, New Mexico, uh, California, uh, is uh, heaven for not only drug cartels, but heaven for terrorists. And as I indicated, uh, you have right now, as we talk, you have multitude of Iranian and Hezbollah terrorists operating in this area, and they consider this the current uh, policy of basically tolerating waves of uh, illegal aliens. They consider that uh, to be a major vehicle to penetrate the U.S., and to advance their goal of terrorizing Americans. You know, surely with all of your work, you have heard of, I mean, even the FBI published the Muslim Brotherhood's The Project. Uh, is it not amazing to see uh, what some would say is not only complicity, but an enabling of the project by the Muslim Brotherhood to be instituted here in the United States? Well, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which, by the way, was established back in 1928 in uh, Egypt, has been operating in a very, very uh, smart uh, manner. Uh, they have their social welfare branches, they have their cultural branches, they have their political branches, as well as terrorist branches. And supposedly, each one is an autonomous or independent uh, branch, while in fact all of them are there driven by the same uh, vision. And the vision, again, is based on the idea which goes back to the seventh century, the appearance of Islam, that the world is divided between the abode of Islam and the abode of the infidel, where at the end of the day, the infidel will have no choice but to submit to the believers, whether peacefully or militarily. And in the process, in the process, they have followed different tactics, such as jihad, holy uh, war. Uh, and jihad, holy war has been part of the curriculum, the curriculum in Iran, the curriculum in the Palestinian Authority, where they literally brainwash K through 12 to join the ranks of those who are fighting for the noble cause of establishing a unified Islamic uh, entity. And they urge them to become martyrs for their cause. Muslim Brotherhood has been since 1928, the, by far the largest Sunni Muslim terror organization. They operate political and cultural uh, 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 groups in the USA uh, until January of uh, 2021, those groups were excluded from the White House. Today, sadly, the White House has been reopened to those groups under the false assumption that they are merely agents of political activity, educational activity, religious activity, while in fact, all of those activities have been drafted to advance the goal of the Muslim Brotherhood, which, by the way, is the number one threat to every single pro-American Arab regime in the Middle East. There is a reason why the pro-American Egyptians and Saudis and Jordanians and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain are fighting the Muslim Brotherhood because the Muslim Brotherhood attempts to topple those pro-American regimes. Sadly, in Washington, there are people who ignore it and they take the same Muslim Brotherhood as if it's an innocent political or cultural organization. It's a self-destruct uh, policy. Well, it, it was no secret to the FBI and the CIA in the 80s that 
The project, folks, you can Google that. The project by Muslim Brotherhood was to, quote unquote, bring us down, bring down our miserable house from the inside. And were you surprised when the Obama administration not only had ISNA, which is a branch of the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, and CARE, another branch of the Muslim, brother, Muslim Brotherhood, regularly in the White House, but Obama also gave over $7 billion to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to wreak havoc, uh, havoc and to terrorize the Egyptians. Were you surprised to see that? Well, I, I was not surprised because I, I was familiar with the worldview of the key policymakers during the Obama administration. And by the way, they are the same. He, he, he did well for them, didn't he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But those are the same key players in the current uh, administration. Oh, course, if you go yeah. back to those uh, days, back in 2011, talking about wishful thinking and reality, the Obama-Biden administration, and again, Secretary Blinken today played a key role then as national security advisor to Vice President uh, uh, Biden. Uh, Jake uh, Sullivan, national security today, played a key role also in the Obama-Biden administration. And back in 2011, they decided to initiate a NATO-US-led military offensive against Gaddafi. Now, Gaddafi was not the pious leaders, but the reason they wanted him out was because he ruthlessly treated opposition elements. The one thing they missed was that those opposition elements were Islamic terrorist organizations, which prior to 2000. To 2003 were supported by Gaddafi until he realized that this is a self-destruct support. And since 2003, 2004, Gaddafi became the number one warrior against Islamic terrorists in North Africa. It was that Gaddafi which they uh, attacked back in 2011. As a result, Gaddafi was lynched by those Muslim terrorists dragged, his body was dragged uh, on the streets of, uh, of uh, Tripoli, uh, Libya. Since that time, Libya has become absolutely uncontrollable platform of Islamic terrorism, haunting Europe, haunting Africa, haunting the Middle East, with the aims of gradually also approach the U.S. Uh, itself. But once again, it was the victory of wishful thinking over reality. The same thing, as you uh, refer to, afflicted them when they mistreated uh, Egypt during Mubarak time, and then tried to support the Muslim Brotherhood who took over control of Egypt. And until today, until today, they are very upset with General Sisi, who today rules Egypt, who took down the Muslim Brotherhood regime. Yeah. And the current administration is pressuring both Egypt and Saudi Arabia on account of those two pro-American regimes, war on Muslim Brotherhood terrorism inside and war on pro-Iranian terrorists in Yemen. In Yemen, you have the Houthi uh, terrorists who are supported by Iran and they are supported for a reason. The Iranians are trying to uh, employ Yemen as a stepping ground to take down the pro-American regime in Saudi Arabia, the northern neighbor of uh, Yemen. The current administration is very upset with the Saudis determination to fight those terrorists in uh, Yemen. And as a result, by the way, they have withheld shipment of vital military systems to uh, Saudi Arabia. They have withheld a uh, certain part of the financial assistance to Egypt. And this is a self-defeating policy, not because it weakens 
pro-American Arab regimes, but because it forces, forces them to court the Russians and the Chinese as an alternative source of supply of arms, an alternative source of support. And certainly, Russia and China inside Saudi Arabia and Egypt does not bode well for the Middle East, does not bode well for the stability of the world, does not bode well for the interest of the USA. And it's time to allow reality to prevail rather than being taken down or over by uh, wishful thinking. Well, you can go back to Gaddafi, you know, uh, Hillary uh, celebrated his death. You know, as she quoted, we came, we saw, we killed him. And uh, most Americans don't know that, that Obama gave $7 billion to our nation's enemies. Well, $150 billion was the bonanza given to the Ayatollahs of Iran in oh, yeah. return for signing the 2015 nuclear accord. Now, this is a very important uh, uh, milestone because one should analyze it. What did that bonanza do to the Ayatollahs. The expectations by the Obama-Biden administration was that such a bonanza would induce them to moderate their policies. However, as expected, by the way, as expected, the $150 billion were not directed at enhancing standard of living, education, and health inside Iran. The $150 billion was invested in expanding the terror and subversion and war machinery of Iran, and again, all the way to Latin America. And the question is, would the current administration learn from those past mistakes, or God forbids, would it repeat those mistakes at the expense of America's homeland security and national security. Well, my friend, some would say we are in the third term of Obama because it seems to be apparent to some that the current president doesn't seem to know what room he is in. You know, as far as Benghazi goes, um, uh, some would say that that was the arming of ISIS. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, the result of a film, just like coronavirus was not the result of bat soup. Uh, what, would your comments, what would your comments be on, on the Benghazi crisis as it begins to reemerge? Uh, where, was, where, where was Hillary for seven hours and where was yeah. the then president in his second yeah. term, not his third term now, but his second term during, during Benghazi? What were your thoughts on Benghazi? Well, uh, once again, a repeat of prior uh, critical mistakes. Back in uh, 79, February 1st, 79, Ayatollah Khomeini landed in uh, Tehran. The Shah of Iran was able to flee uh, Iran and avoid hanging or lynching. And contrary to the expectations by then President Jimmy Carter, right away Ayatollah Khomeini became the number one enemy of the U.S., referring to the U.S. as the great Satan. And here was Jimmy Carter, who provided tailwind to the rise of the Ayatollahs uh, in Iran, who literally stepped the back of the Shah of Iran, who was the American policeman of the Gulf, the most important American strategic asset in the entire Middle East. And in return, in return, the Ayatollahs of Iran took over the American embassy and held 63 Americans hostages for 444 days. And you move fast forward to Benghazi and you find out, well, apparently some folks did not learn the proper lessons from the takeover of the American embassy by terrorists who were aided by the U.S. And once again, U.S. was very instrumental of taking down Gaddafi and allowing the Islamic terrorists to take over. And what did those terrorists do in return? Taking over the American Consulate General in Benghazi, lynching 
the American ambassador who happened to be there at that time, lynching few other uh, Americans, and once again proving the known fact. Terrorists bite the hands that feed them. Jimmy Carter learned it back in 1979. Uh, Obama learned that in the experience of Benghazi, and in fact, even before that, you go back to 1990, August of 1990, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. The tragic uh, uh, reality was that a week or 10 days before the invasion of Kuwait, Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, had a meeting with the American ambassador to Baghdad, April Gillespie, and he asked her point blank, what will the US do if we in Iraq invade our province 19, that's how they refer to Kuwait, and bring it back to the Iraqi motherland? The response by the ambassador, as instructed, by then Secretary of State Jim Baker was, this is none of our business. This is an inter-Arab issue. Now, what, what should Saddam Hussein understand other than green light from Washington? Now, here was Washington who gave him green light. Here is Washington who back in the 1980s, I think it was 1986, saved him from the jaws of the Ayatollahs of Iran, who were gradually overcoming Iraq in a war between Iraq and Iran. It was US which saved the life of Saddam Hussein from the wrath of the Iranians. Until the day of the invasion, the US shared with, uh, with Saddam Hussein intelligence uh, uh, cooperation, provided Saddam Hussein with dual use sophisticated systems, provided Saddam Hussein with $5 billion loan guarantees. And it was that Saddam Hussein who hit an ally of the US, uh, Kuwait, threatening to move on and take down the pro-American regime in Saudi Arabia. Once again, terrorists do bite the hand that feeds them. And it's the uh, obligation, it behooves the US to approach the Middle East in a realistic way and not in a wishful thinking uh, way. It's natural for the Westerners for Western society to seek peace, to seek accommodation, to seek an end to war. But we have to realize there are many parts of the globe, in fact, most of the globe does not think like we do in the West. Most of the globe, especially no. in the Middle East, they cannot, they cannot uh, digest Western values and institutions such as peaceful coexistence, democracy, human rights, good faith negotiation. But here we have today negotiation with Iran under the assumption that the Iranians are potentially good faith negotiators. And if uh, uh, showered with a very generous financial and diplomatic package, the Ayatollahs of Iran are going to be induced to uh, be amenable to peaceful coexistence with the Sunni Arab neighbors in the Persian Gulf. I wish it would be true, but sadly, this has not been the reality of the Middle East during the last 1400 years in general, certainly not since the rise to power of the Ayatollahs of Iran back in February of 1979. There was, by the way, a leading, a leading Middle East historian in London University, Professor Eli Kaduri, the late Professor Eli Kaduri, in my mind, um, uh, a major, major groundbreaking Middle East uh, historian. And he wrote books about the failed policies of Britain and US in the Middle East, convincing themselves 
that they can apply Western norms to the Arab Middle East. And at one point, he wrote that expecting Arab societies in the Middle East to embrace democracy, human rights, peaceful coexistence, resemble of an attempt to force water or river to run from the sea to the mountain top. Now, I wish it would be possible. Sadly, in reality, it's impossible. I believe you, and I, I agree with you. You know, uh, the question in the minds of American citizens who are learning this for the first time, uh, the Obama administration uh, uh, very generously helped fund the Arab Spring, which was nothing more than the Arab minority terrorizing the Egyptians. I love the Egyptians. I know the Egyptians. When I go to Cairo, everyone knows who Obama is, and they always ask, why haven't you arrested him yet? Uh, some would say, or some would ask, is this a matter of epic ignorance? Is it a matter of miscalculation? Or is it a matter of collaboration? Whatever the answer is, you know, you know a lot about a person uh, or a nation when you know what they want. If you know that a theocracy wants to dominate the world with a one world religion, uh, Islam or the sword, if you know that's what they want and that's what they, their aims are, then you know that Western thought will have no place in the world of Islam. So do you feel at liberty to say which it is? Is it ignorance? Surely you've seen uh, by trial and error what, work, what works and what doesn't work. Is it miscalculations yet again? Is it amnesia or is it complicity and in some cases collaboration? I, I would give uh, policymakers benefit of the doubt and suggest that they're driven by genuine benevolent uh, ambition to bring about peace, to bring about an end to war. Sadly, when you apply such noble ideas in an unrealistic manner, you provide tailwind to the most outrageous to the most rogue form of terrorism in the Middle East, which once again comes to haunt America as uh, well. We're talking about a global village. I mean, the world is becoming more and more globalized. You cannot uh, disengage yourself from the rest of the world because the rest of the world is going to reach you on, uh, in your own trenches, in your own uh, homeland. I remember the old uh, football uh, advice, uh, the closer you are to the other team's end zone, the closer you are to score a touchdown, the closer you are to your own end zone, the closer they are to score a touchdown. The same thing applies to the war on terrorism, whether it is Ayatollahs of Iran terrorism, whether it is Muslim Brotherhood terrorism, the idea that you can just ignore it, you can just disengage, uh, is not working, is not realistic. Certainly, the idea that you can transform them into benevolent Western entities has absolutely and sadly nothing to do with uh, with reality. You know, the, the leftist mentality, I, I, if, if what you say, uh, Yoram, is that this is a matter of um, perhaps naivety, naivety, or maybe it's just miscalculation yet again, um, the leftist mentality is that man is inherently good. It, 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 they just need more education. They just need jobs. I remember Obama saying, well, ISIS just needs jobs when a, a, a good number of those fighting and terrorizing the innocents in ISIS were educated here, and they're educated in universities across the world. Well, you you and, had the, the work, work the place mind, mind, in Fort Hood. Things, I believe it just shows the, the fallacy of believing that man is inherently good. Man, I don't I do not believe that man is inherently good. The Western mindset, which was based on Judeo-Christian values, uh, acknowledges that man is not inherently good. He needs a moral internal compass. And we, just like in the case of Benghazi, when, when you remove external constraints, then what is in the heart of those who are driving the bus 
will prevail. In this case, the terrorist that that uh, 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 that Gaddafi was fighting in Libya, he held them at bay. But when they ran wild with all the money given to them by our State Department, and when they went ran wild with the vacuum of leadership in Libya, uh, the removal of external constraints showed what was on the internal, which was no constraints, no moral code, uh, mayhem, killing, stealing, and destroying uh, in, the, in the name of their of their uh, uh, what some would say is, is radical ideology, but is at the very base of of the the global caliphate that Islam uh, seeks to to uh, achieve, and so. Uh, the Western mind doesn't doesn't understand that. Uh, there needs to be internal constraints, a code of morality, a a, a, a love for your fellow man. And you know, just like uh, Osama bin Laden once said that a child will choose the stronger horse. Uh, some some person dancing with flowers in in the name of multiculturalism will never survive in the Middle East versus the warrior on the horse with the sword. And so. After, surely after all this time, after over 50 years uh, of your intervention, uh, thank the Lord, uh, with, with U.S. and Israeli policy and, and U.S. policy in the Middle East, surely after all this time we can understand this, that this is an ideology that will never be Western, and the stronger horse will prevail. Uh, backing down and, 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 and you know, ref taking a step back from your rightful territory will only open uh, a, 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 a fresh expanse of this ideology that wishes to uh, dominate the world uh, and, and not a democracy uh, mentality. And so surely, is there anyone in the administration, I wouldn't expect this administration, this is Obama's third term in my opinion and the opinions of many others, but is there anyone that you know in American leadership that understands that this is not only an uphill battle, is it an impossible battle uh, that the Middle East will never embrace Western ideology unless it conforms or unless it acknowledges some form of a Judeo-Christian value? Well, there's no doubt that the current manner of negotiating with Ayatollahs of Iran is based on a series of false and unrealistic uh, assumption. One of them, for instance, which is related to what just correctly uh, uh, said, is the waiving of the military option. Uh, the current administration made it very clear. They do not consider military option to be part of the negotiation with Iran, nor the regime change option. The fundamental common sense is when you deal with a rogue entity, you must have a club over the head of that entity or else you're going to lose the game. And right now, we, the Ayatollahs of Iran, are being told by Americans, don't worry, we're not going to hit you. We're not going to try and cause a regime change in Iran, which, by the way, would be to the satisfaction of most Iranians. The, the Ayatollah's regime uh, yes, level of repression and discrimination yes, against was. religious uh, and, uh, and ethnic minorities is unprecedented. Uh, the war on women, uh, women's rights in Iran is, uh, is unprecedented. However, the current administration is urged right now by no other than a Democratic senator, uh, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Senator uh, Bob Menendez from New Jersey. He, by the way, is one of the four Democrats who opposed the 2015 nuclear accord with uh, Iran. Good. He gave a speech at the, at the committee uh, on February 1st, a few days ago, where he harshly criticized the way the U.S. negotiates with Iran. And among other criticism, he indicated there must be a military option on the table. In fact, he went as far as suggesting that the U.S. should conduct 
joint military exercises with Saudi Arabia, with the Emirates, with Israel, among others, strategizing a potential attack on Iran. And he said, unless the Iranians realize that this is going to be a real option, you don't have any chance of gaining anything from the current uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, sadly, at this stage, the leaders of the, uh, of the Biden team in the areas of foreign policy and national security do not want a military option to interfere uh, with them in conducting diplomatic exchanges with the Ayatollahs. Well, you know, I, I was shocked that Kerry, who even during the Trump administration, John Kerry going to Iran and attempting to negotiate. Now, they thought he was a joke. They laughed at him behind his back. And of course, but, half of America did the same thing, too. But it baffles me. Uh, but and, it, and, it should, not, what, should what, not It should not surprise you because it's the same John Kerry. It doesn't surprise me. It it's the same John me. Kerry who welcomed Bashar Assad of Syria as a moderate leader. And he concluded from the fact that the Bashar Assad studied in England and married a Syrian woman who was born in England and was the president of the Syrian Internet Association, his conclusion was, with such qualification, he must be moderate, he will be pro-American. Uh, pro and in fact, John Kerry was a personal friend of both Assad Sr. and Assad Jr. until the civil war exploded in, uh, in Syria. You know, it, it, it seems it's very, very clear that uh, uh, tre uh, what, what some would say is treason and and espionage and uh, betrayal and and extortion seems to be okay if you're on the left side. What do you encourage Americans to do? Americans who, uh, and of course, anytime I go around the world, nobody believes this last election was credible. Nobody believes uh, that I talked to in different countries, from France to Germany to, to Egypt, that this leader is anything but a stand-in for Obama. Uh, uh, how would you encourage patriot Americans to pray and to behave uh, during this time of uncertainty or complicity? What would you encourage us to do? What can we do as citizens? Uh, I, in, in my humble mind, it starts from what I call basic values. I've been a student of American history for many years. I've been in touch with the U.S. since uh, the late 1960s. And there's no doubt in my mind that the reason for the U.S. to rise to the position of global leadership, uh, the reason for the U.S. to become the world leader in the areas of science and technology and medicine and agriculture, as well as defense, as well as defense, has to do with, especially with one institution, which I call the legacy of the founding fathers, or the legacy of the early pilgrims and the founding fathers. Sadly, from my perspective, in recent years, I have noticed a gradual and even recently rapid departure from the legacy of the founding uh, fathers which catapulted the U.S. to unprecedented heights in human history, my hope, my pray is that Americans will realize that this is the time to study the legacy of the Founding Fathers and to re-embrace themselves with that uh, legacy in an attempt to overcome the current erosion of U.S. stature in the world, because the world is not blind. And the world noticed not only the flight from Afghanistan, it was not really a withdrawal, it was a flight from Afghanistan. The world does consider that a sign of uh, weakness. 
And I have no doubt, just as we in, uh, in Israel, to uh, re-embrace ourselves with Jewish history, with Israeli history, is the most important prescription for strength in face of future challenges. So it is in the U.S. And in fact, and in fact, as you, uh, I assume, uh, know very well, uh, U.S. and Israel share a lot as far as Judeo-Christians are concerned, a lot as far as history is concerned. You go back to the 1620 Mayflower, and those 102 passengers on the Mayflower, which docked at uh, Plymouth uh, Rock in 1620, they considered themselves to be the modern-day chosen people. They considered the land which they uh, arrived at to be the modern-day promised land. And therefore, when you study the map of the U.S., you see a few thousand sites, towns, cities, national parks, mountains, desert, with biblical names. Uh, we speak right now, I, I, you are in Odessa, Texas, I'm in Jerusalem, Israel. We have one Jerusalem in Israel. In the U.S., you have 18 Jerusalems. You have 30 Salems. Wow. Salem is the original biblical name of Jerusalem. You have over 80 Bethels. You have over uh, 20 Shilohs. Uh, I was recently at Zion National Park. It's not only Zion, which is a biblical uh, name, but when you start the visit of uh, Zion National Park, you see on the left side three very impressive cliffs, and the guy tells you those are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, I worked for three years at the Israeli embassy in Washington. I was in charge of our congressional uh, relations, and I paid visits to the Capitol building. First time I entered the chamber of the house, I noticed that in front of the chair of the speaker, there is a, a statue of Moses. Now, he's not the only statue. There are 23 uh, such statues, the 23 major lawgivers in human history. But he is at the center facing the speaker, and he's the only one looking straight. When I asked the curator of Capitol Building, why is Moses looking straight and all the rest are in profile, the response was, aren't you a Jew from Israel? Don't you know Moses is the foundation of <clears throat> human law? The other great <clears throat> lawgivers are the derivatives of Moses. And when you go to the Supreme Court, you have six or seven statues and engravements of Moses and the Ten Commandments. The adherence to Judeo-Christian values is still deep in the U.S., not as deep as it used to be, but still pretty uh, deep. And that's, in my mind, the major foundation of the very special ties between the U.S. and uh, Israel. Your manager, the Edinger Report, what an honor it is to talk to you today. Uh, from it's my, my honor. And I hope... Please tell me that we can do this again and again. Absolutely. And again, Absolutely. your website, the Editor Report. Uh, I, I, I have not seen a finer website that is more insightful uh, for those who want to know what's happening uh, in Israel and around the world. Uh, your work as an ambassador is unprecedented. And I am grateful to meet you and honored to speak with you. And thank you for reminding our viewers how important it is. It's interesting that Judeo-Christian values and patriotism and wisdom seem to go hand in hand. GLC viewers, go to the Editor Report today and get behind this work. Is there a place that people can, can uh, financially contribute to what you're doing, sir? Well, uh, you can see it on the website. Uh, there is a... You can click on donation. And in fact, uh, I'm supported is. by a, a Houston-based 
uh, non-profit educational uh, foundation which would uh, uh, accept any uh, contribution with much, much appreciation. Well, it's at theedingerreport.com, folks. Thank you again, Yorm. We will talk to you next time, my friend. And we'll talk to you next time on Light of the Southwest. God bless you.